I feel that um, feeding into our current moment and looking forwards, I am very excited about the possibility of us <clears throat> creating a world spirituality that I think could be the first ever complete spiritual path that there's ever been on the planet. And I, I want to distinguish it from the um, New Age type spirituality of the um, 1980s and 90s, uh, maybe 1970s, that kind of era. Um, <clears throat> I think one of the things that was lacking in those days was the uh, the internet as it is today um, with the kind of quality of, of internet technology we have now and I think that's a potentiating force and I'll um, come back to that later. There's There's been historically the spiritual traditions from around the world have been quite isolated from each other. I know there's there's been with a with a silk route and places like that across um, Central Asia there's a lot of contact between spiritual and religious traditions but i think we we live in in a kind of a version of that on steroids now um and i think that's uh, it's a very exciting time so i recently was listening to an interview with uh, i won't name them but uh, they they're the the most probably the most famous meditation teacher in the world was saying that the in uh, his opinion the essence of all spirituality is this recognition of your identity as uh, formless awareness which is a sort of uh, typical realization in a lot of uh, buddhist meditation vedanta hinduism those those kind of things uh, zen meditation the, the big mind in zen the cloud of unknowing in um christianity and <clears throat> although that that type of spiritual practice does appear in a lot of um the world's traditions and and is an, a very important component to awakening and uh spiritual maturity and progress and in my own practice has formed a very large part of my meditation practice that I've been doing at this point for nearly 25 years. Um, so I don't want to belittle the importance of that. But when I heard that, I thought, well, you know, this guy has a massive platform, uh, you know, millions and millions of people around the world take that piece of information away um, with them. And I, and I felt there was, it was such, um, there's so much more to spirituality than that just that on its own and i i think um to, thinking of uh, as ken wilbur's talked about the, the first second and third person types of of um practice that sort of waking up to that absolute subjectivity that is formless awareness is it, such a powerful realization and shift in well, your identity although the, the paradox is that it, they say in Zen it's the gateless gate. You know when when you, that that realization dawns and you realize you've always been that way anyway. It's so powerful in the sense that you know, uh, in, as in the sense of the way Ramana Maharshi would describe it is it's it's pre you, you, as your awareness is present in uh, waking, dreaming, and deep sleep, whereas all the other the aspects of form what they might call form in buddhism um maybe we might call mother nature or the goddess or something like that uh, it's just kind of ever changing mutating evolving impermanent um element side whole side of the um this whole spiritual thing and th there's this kind of privileging of the permanent over the temporary or the unchanging over the the changing and that's gone on a long time and uh, some people have named that hyper masculine approach to spirituality the up and out approach <clears throat> and uh, I can you know putting my finger to the wind I can sense a change 
happening amongst people of uh, this what I might call more of an, uh, an integrated non-duality. A lot of people, when they speak of non-duality, they talk about they're really referring to this formless awareness that's uh, utterly uncontracted um, and uh, open to uh, anything that happens in the moment. And uh, they kind of uh, belittle um, the whole manifest side of the, the, the world and the universe. And... Um, I, I think there's a there's a big change in that more of the the waking down the embodied awakening and, and those kind of things and it's a bit like saying that um, a stone is good and a flower is bad and uh, personally I don't buy that and I think a lot of people are realizing that um, they've kind of been hoodwinked or f uh, fallen for the, the 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 power the magnetism of that first person experience and realization of that which is very very powerful and can really draw people in um <clears throat> i think we, we're moving out of an era where people were looking for the one big truth um you know the, the sort of mono perspectival monism of this uh this one uh, unassailable truth that held up in all circumstances and our con contemporary moment uh, is all about a plurality of truths and I think that's really healthy because going forwards into the future, uh, one of the buzzwords that's around is resilience. And we all know that a res uh, resilient ecosystem, for example, is one that's very diverse with uh, lots of different creatures, species all interacting. Um, and uh, I we, on, um, we have a little bit of land and about tw uh, 20 years ago we planted some new trees there and we were too heavily reliant on um, oak and ash trees which are sort of, uh, trees that do very well in, in England um, and everything was going great until a couple of years ago we have this disease called ash dieback has uh, come into the UK and started wiping out all of the ash trees so that was a, a wake up call and we have to re remove them all um, so we've lost probably a quarter to a third uh, of, of all of the trees in this plantation, which has, has been really bad. And we were over-reliant on these these two. And so what we did was we replanted um, the trees that were cut down with um, a wide selection of about 25 different species of tree. So that's, we draw an analogy with that, with um, spiritual practice going forwards. If we're too reliant on, um, you know, one type of uh, practice it's not going to create the type of humans that are going to be resilient with um, all the turbulent cultural and social natural um, phenomena that seems to be coming down the pipe our way potentially um, <clears throat> so I was watching uh, the Joe Rogan podcast which um, I think is a really interesting uh, piece of media um, that's you know, very popular at the moment. I think it's one of the most popular podcasts in the world. And um, kind of got me interested into, um, I, I think you could make an argument that Joe Rogan's podcast is integral media. Um, I got me interested in mixed martial arts and it, he was talking with someone, I think it was Sam Harris, um, and they were talking about these videos they seen on YouTube of these martial arts uh, masters fighting with their students and what the video was was this guy standing there um, with students coming at him left right and center and he was just sort of like wiggling his finger and just holding his hand out and the students were writhing around in agony and flying all over the place and this had been obviously going on for decades and the the teacher didn't realize um well i mean he was kind of being reinforced by the reaction of the students so the students thought this teacher was amazing um and they kind of had this if you've watched uh darren brown shows or you know with people with hypnotists who do suggestion and that kind of thing you realize it's quite easy for people to get into these situations where they really believe something's happening um, and they so students and teacher are reinforcing um, 
the this situation. And this particular teacher teacher got very confident in their ability and put out a reward, I think, of a of a hundred thousand dollars for anybody in the world to come up and fight this guy. Um so this, in a way, you could think of this as the, the first person experience of this particular martial arts school and tradition was, was now being brought out into the second and third person perspective of the, uh, the commons. Um, and <clears throat> a uh, mixed martial artist took him up. Um, this is somebody who fights uh, you know, in, in the octagon, um, doing grappling and striking and all this, these different um, martial arts. Took this guy up on the challenge. It was all filmed. It's up on YouTube. And um, you know, the referee says, okay, fight. And just instantly the mixed martial artist goes up and just completely pummels this guy uh, who thought he was amazing. The bloke's utterly shocked, sort of gets back up, is bleeding, you know, has another go and just uh, very quickly gets completely annihilated um, by this mixed martial artist, and that made me realize. I felt I felt really sorry for this this guy because he thought he was incredible, and for for decades all of his students had been thinking he was incredible and telling he was incredible, and um, they'd kind of created this bizarre insular situation. But then when that was brought out into the second and third person perspective interactions with the wider world, they uh, had a rude awakening. And I really feel we are in a similar situation with the spiritual traditions. Um, <clears throat> so a, a really interesting moment was when the first Ultimate Fighting Championships happened in 1993, UFC 1. And it was it, it, for hundreds and thousands of years different martial arts traditions had been kind of boldly claiming my style is the best i can defeat you any day of the week um but not really kind of having to prove that in the arena of, of combat it was all um self-reporting and so there was um some a brazilian family called the gracies who had trained in jiu-jitsu from a Japanese teacher, but they kind of changed it into uh, what's known now known as Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, and they put on this massive competition that was really popular, televised all over the world. And the UFC now is an absolutely enormous, multi-billion-dollar uh, industry. And so, for the first time, all of these different martial arts traditions were fighting in the arena in public for the whole world to see, and there were. Uh, some rude awakenings to the limitations of some of these paths. And as it turned out that the uh, winner of this particular, this first UFC competition was this not very strong, quite skinny, but very, very skilled Brazilian jiu-jitsu practitioner um, called Hoyce Gracie. And he beat people from all sorts of martial arts traditions from around the world. And so as time went on, um, people started to understand how to defeat uh, jiu -jit Brazilian jiu-jitsu practitioners. What they found is that if you're a striker, like you did uh, boxing, kickboxing, uh, Muay Thai, those kind of uh, fighting techniques, if you could keep a, um, someone who was a grappler, like a jiu-jitsu or wrestler practitioner, if you could keep them on their feet then, and you could land punches and kicks, then you could win. So then the jiu-jitsu practitioners had to uh, learn some striking techniques, punching and kicking. So now you have a situation where the, the, the best mixed martial artists in the world have a very strong grappling game and striking game. And they tend to specialise in one of these two areas, but um, the, they, they'll get the other area trained up as to the highest level they can. And I think spirituality is in a similar situation now. Um, and the arena of combat is the internet. So, you know, for, for, for a very, very long time, spiritual traditions have been saying, you know, our tradition's the best one. You know, we've, we've got this really strong uh, meditation tradition or we have this very strong psychedelics tradition or this yoga tradition. It's, it's the best. Well, we're now in a, in a, in a situation where 
you can actually see what types of people the tra these traditions produce. And if we to, to use some of the, the integral language, how good, true and beautiful are the people that are produced by these traditions? And with things like YouTube, so in the past, you know, you might read books and things, but so much is left out of reading a book. If you um, watch people on YouTube, you can see how they em uh, embody what they're teaching or talking about. And you can interact with the community of people that are built around them. Um, so there's there, you, there's a, a much more, there's a deeper access to what's behind the curtain, you know, with these with these uh, religious and spiritual traditions. So one thing we know uh, from history is that everything so it's, has been found sacred somewhere and at some time somewhere in the world. And what's interesting is what's sacred in one tradition is often taboo in another one. So you could use so sex is a um, is a sacred act in the tantric traditions, but um, it's a very very dangerous thing in the the um, Christian monastic traditions, for example, and is a taboo. Um, or psychedelics are the sacrament of the shamanic traditions from um, around the world, indigenous cultures, um, but were made, uh, outlawed by the axial religions, so the Abrahamic religions, um, for example. So if everybody's found all of these things sacred at some point, perhaps we could just assume that everything is actually sacred and uh, use that as our starting point. And again, you know, with the internet, we got such good access to uh, drug um, education, for example. Um, you know, when I had my first experiences with psychedelics and drugs and stuff in general, it was in the uh, 1990s when the internet was, was really quite um, poor. And so all we had were the urban myths and, um, uh, you know, advice from our peers, which was terrible, um, really, really bad. And it, it's, it's, it's a great situation now where you've got all these forums where you can get really good information. Um, and I think it's really exciting. But so much of these taboos uh, that have come from the past have just been based on on ignorance. So um, if you were to look, if you were to think about, say, um, Tibetan, Buddhist, t Tibetan Buddhism doesn't talk a lot about psychedelics. And um, you know, if you talk about psychedelics with a lot of uh, Tibetan Buddhist practitioners, they'd say that's not the 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 right way to go. But the question to ask them is, have you ever taken psychedelics? Um, and if they say yes, uh, you know, I went to a, a rock concert in the the nineteen seventies and took LSD and had a great night. That's not really good enough. It's a bit like with these uh, meditation studies that have been done with graduate students where they say, you know, do do 20 minutes of meditation a day for eight weeks and then we'll get you in an fMRI scanner and see what your brain's doing. That's not as interesting as people that actually have this as a long-term practice. Um, so going back to the psychedelics thing, you know, how many Zen monks, for example, have um, drunk ayahuasca regularly over a period of years and then said yeah actually that's all a load of rubbish and my zen stuff's really uh, the way to go you know that's I, I would want to hear that person comment rather than someone say I've never done drugs um, or psychedelics and I think that's all a load of rubbish I mean you could say the same for people that only ever do psychedelics like uh, some uh, shamanic traditions um, they might think, oh, you know, we've got these really powerful plant medicines. They give you these whopping uh, spiritual experiences. Look at those stupid people sitting on their meditation cushions for hours and weeks and years and they're not getting anywhere and they're just getting bored and all that kind of thing. Well, that's, that's, that can happen in meditation, but uh, it, not, you know, when people meditate, um, they get good at meditation and they've done it for a long time. They have a very different experience of that. But you have to actually practice that in a kind of long term practice to have that uh, experience and realization. Just while we're on the topic of uh, Buddhism, I think 
you know, you if you if you were to bring the the um, Abrahamic religions together and put them alongside the, so I'm, t- I'm talking about Islam, um, <clears throat> Christianity, Judaism. If you brought them alongside some of the the Eastern traditions, um, like Buddhism, for example, I think you can really see uh, that the the Eastern traditions have taken this meditation technology, um, these different yogic uh, practices, uh, meditation practices, very, very, very far. Um, and the that's almost their sort of speciality. But what the Abrahamic religions have done, I think, exceptionally well, is develop this very, very rich, um, juicy love this burning love of God or the goddess Mary Jesus um, and I, I you know I love Buddhism a lot of my personal practice has been Buddhist over the years but I think there's a there's a kind of coolness to Buddhism um, and I think you can see that in the words they tend to use for love um, are compassion whereas like that they're quite cool words whereas in say the Sufi tradition, you know, it's it's they they're, they're very direct about it, but it's burning, passionate love, um, and I think those two traditions can really learn from each other. And as practitioners of a of a world spirituality, we can we can combine those two things because I I think they potentiate each other, and they're important. I think two other streams that would be very important to bring together are the. Uh, sudden and gradual paths so the sudden path is uh, techniques which are which encourage immediate and direct awakening Um, and I think those are very important particularly in this time we're living in because we don't really know how much longer we're going to be living with good times Um, so do you want to take a gamble and think right well I'm only going to be enlightened you know in in, in, after 20 years of meditation or w- how about being enlightened right now so you you, you don't know when you're going to die um, so I think that the sudden path is really important but at the same time uh, you know people that go a bit too far into the sudden path think that they don't really need to do any long-term practice or work and think that they're there's you know they can just sit down and play video games all day because they are the universe and the universe is enlightened or the cosmos is enlightened so are they and there's nothing they need to do but some really the maturation happens over long term practice um, and the, the gradual path and in the same way that a young whiskey is not a sophisticated drink it's a little bit rough and if you drink a whiskey that's um, been aged uh, it's, it's a it's a really delicious rich experience drinking that there's a totally different drink and uh you know that's a sort of a, a metaphor for the difference between um you know things that are, that are too quick versus things that have, have aged and i think you can combine those two <clears throat> modes of practice so one critique to having a uh, bringing these things together is that you might be digging lots of shallow holes Two counter arguments I'd have to that is one is that if we live in an evolving universe, an evolving culture, evolving society, what's a shallow hole now was a deeper hole in the past because we are not starting from zero every time. We're build we're standing on the shoulders of those who have come before us. Um, and the the other thing to um, take into account is the way these different practices potentiate each other. Uh, So they're not separate, lots of separate things. They are connected, integrated, and they have a positive feedback loop that creates an updraft. And it's also very common to, uh, and and I'm I'm recommending this, that people people have natural talents, we're all unique. So you, uh, you just, people will excel in um, one, two, three areas or something, um, and the other areas they keep as as, as well developed as possible. 
Um, so I, I'm not recommending some tradition where every you know you just flatten everything out like that, and everybody does the same thing. So, you know, what what does this world spirituality basically look like? Um, and I think if we if we look at the the world's uh, spiritual traditions, and and this is something that's been talked about a lot by Ken Wilber, for example, uh, amongst many others, is that you have um, physical practices, subtle practices, and formless practices, and um, any one practice might span um, all of these. So if you, so by by physical, I mean some kind of bod- bodily based practice, because I, you know, again, this is something that seems to be in the zeitgeist now, or, or uh, you know, out there that people are talking a lot about is. The embodied embodiment of embodied realization, and that that matter, your body, is amazing, and worthy of respect, and sacred, and alive. So you know, we're we're talking um, hatha hatha yoga. Um, there's some tantric sex practices, um, and uh, um, I mean, I would I would put weightlifting and strength training in there something i love um and uh, nutrition just you know health and fitness and again those are things that seem very mundane to uh, a kind of a, a spiritual person you know so i'm thinking of my my zen monk example might say you know lifting weights is an incredibly mundane activity and part of this whole uh, um, you know, stupid world of illusion, and uh, I, I just don't think there's any room uh, for that kind of ignorance now, nowadays. Um, and then subtle practices, we're talking um, some psycho- psychotherapeutic techniques, lucid dreaming, dream yoga, dream analysis, um, a lot of psychedelics probably fit into this category, um, th- those kind of things. And then the formless is that what the meditation teacher I was talking about at the beginning of this uh, video, yeah, the, the formless awareness, that recognition of I amness, the the complete, empty, transparent, luminous, bright awareness that has no form, but nonetheless is unmistakably part of all of our experience, all the time, and uh, you know, a lot of meditation practices lead you to that place. And uh, so I think that a a complete practice needs to span those three and to integrate them, to not treat them as three separate um, realms, but to integrate, hold them as a whole. And any one practice might span all three of these. So if you took tantric sex as an example, there's the the physical component, the, uh, the, the intercourse, to use a rather um, pedestrian term for it and then <clears throat> there's a lot of subtle um, energy experiences happening with with the subtle energies in the, in that act the moment and uh, in it also I've, I've heard people um, talk of suddenly being catapulted out into complete formlessness um, through uh, practicing tantric sex but I think probably tantric sex you know, it's kind of might be primarily a, a subtle practice, probably a little bit on the, the physical ends. But, you know, so I don't want to pigeonhole these practices necessarily. Um, but I, but I think they kind of excel in, in one of one of these areas. I think another thing is that the age of the guru, uh, in my opinion, really is over. And, and, and by guru, I mean one teacher that will tell you how to do every single aspect of your entire life, which has been very common uh, up till now. But again, you know, the Internet's enabled this to happen. We've we've the, the curtain's been pulled back and we've seen what's happened <clears throat> behind the scenes with uh, so many gurus and their students. Um, and it's. It's a very mixed bag. Um, I, I mean, I'm not saying it's all been bad. You know, there's uh, been great things that have come out of gurus and their communities, um, but there's been a lot of harm and pain. And I kind of, I think it's just unnecessary. You can take the good p- 
parts and leave the, the, the bad parts by having multiple teachers in the different uh, in in their different um, specialities, their different uh, techniques and traditions that they are very good at. But you don't go to them for the answers to everything. So I, I like to use the analogy of Hogwarts in Harry Potter, the school. So Dumbledore, the headmaster, is kind of like um, the 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 integrated, complete, ho holistic wizard that the students are aiming to become, something a bit like Dumbledore. But they go to all the different teachers there to learn the different, uh, they learn herb law and plants from this particular teacher, uh, the dark, how to deal with the dark arts from this particular teacher, um, clairvoyance there, and um, how to deal with um, beasts and fantastic beasts and animals with uh, Hagrid, for example. But they don't go to Hagrid to learn about the um, the plants or about clairvoyance. You know, they go to Hagrid to learn about the animals, and then uh, <clears throat> so I think we can take this, a similar approach with teachers in all of these uh, respective domains. Um, and it so I, I'm I'm just going to list a few things I've seen which illustrate the downside of of going to trying to of working with one teacher so i've seen a guru that had no children giving somebody advice on how to parent their children and you know i went to this particular teaching session to learn about meditation um and i had children at the time and i i mean i have children now um was really really uninspired and actually appalled by what he was saying about parenting but what he was saying about meditation was amazing so i kind of put my fingers in the at my ears when he was talking about parenting and listened very hard to the meditation instructions um many gurus say that psychotherapy you know in the past have said psychotherapy is pointless it just re reinforces your belief that you are your story you know makes your reinforces your your ego and all the negativity around that um and then their communities uh, become these kind of torture dungeons for their narcissism to just run rampant. And there's loads of examples of that. Well, I've mentioned sham some shamans who say meditation is a waste of time. Um, so I, I think that we need to encourage this kind of isolationism into the commons. So... They, that these traditions and techniques can compete with each other in the best sense of the word of competition. Um, a bit like this ultimate fighting championships, they can actually be in that arena together and we can see, uh, all for all the world to see, what kind of people do they turn out? What, in what ways are they lacking? Because going forwards, I think the, the kind of metaphor I'd like to use is, is, is this hybrid mongrel approach and if you think about um, with dog breeds um, I've got a Rottweiler purebred um, Rottweiler who I absolutely adore she's the most gorgeous dog but she uh, has got a lot of problems with her joints because she's just bred to be so uh, disproportionately heavy up front with enormous head and shoulders and stuff um, and uh, you know you can think about pugs which are really sweet dogs but they've got all the breathing problems and bulldogs and things like that and if you release them into the wild they are not going to survive uh, they kind of rely on this pampering that we do a little bit like some of the uh, spiritual practice traditions uh, from around the world that have only survived because of this kind of isolationism and pampering not to downplay the extraordinary achievement that but you see the pampering and all that kind of stuff um that has enabled them to go very very deep uh into some of these areas um but you know we can take th those lessons with us you know it's, it's been done um and the 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 healthiest dogs are the kind of mongrels are a little bit of everything and they don't all look the same in case people were worrying about this kind of homogenizing effect. I'm not talking at all about that. I'm talking about unique 
uh, every uh, you know, the world spirituality is, is a kind of ecosystem of unique constellations of some of these essential practice areas. Anyway, so if you if we were to release uh, a mongrel dog into the wild, it's got a much better chance than a pure breed dog like a whippet or something like that. So, um, and I'd just say again, I'd, I'm not saying pure breeds are bad. Mongrels are uh, are good. I think they just in in set in uh, the situation we find ourselves in at the moment. You know, looking at all the all the kind of chaotic things that are potentially um, lying ahead of us. Um, I think this kind of mongrel approach is probably our best chance to navigate what's coming. So that's there. There we go. That's all I got to say on it. And I think the 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 age of the true believers of the one legitimate path is is over. You know, let's see how all these traditions uh, come out against each other. Um, and we can all. It's a grand experiment, but I think it's it's worth it. Thank you very much. Goodbye.